Hey, welcome back to the Duplication Nation MLM podcast. I'm your host, the lovely and talented Randy Gage, <laughs> and I've got the camera on. We're going to throw this up on the YouTube channel for you guys who like to watch over there. Uh, this is one of the chopping it up with dot, dot, dot episodes. If you're new to the podcast, what that means is I get a partner and we riff. We riff on the big kid conversations of what's going on in network marketing, direct selling, leverage sales. Um, it's unedited, unscripted, uh, the down and dirty, the locker room conversations about what happens in the real world in the business. Uh, obviously, it's uh, there's a who's who of top income earners and CEOs and execs who listen. It's designed for corporate people and high level distributors, leaders. But of course, we have thousands of beginning, mid-level distributors who watch who would like to become leaders. So it's we always like to make sure that that's clear in the setup. Um, and then we don't really talk to the audience at all. It's just a conversation I have with a partner and the audience, you get to eavesdrop in. So that's the format. Uh, I'm excited about this. I haven't done a chopping it up for three or four episodes. So I'm really excited to get back with this and even more excited to be doing it with my partner this week, who is a dear friend of many years, Jose Lopez. Welcome to the program. Hello, hello. Well, uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been uh, uh, I've been eavesdropping in your uh, few episodes before with uh, many friends that have been here. So I'm very happy to be here and uh, to have this conversation with you. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. So you know, I always look for um, where do I start each time, and for you, you know what comes to mind. Cuba. <laughs> you were born in Cuba. Your father is still there. Mm -hmm. You've been able to come here, experience free enterprise, have become, um, you know, an amazing American success story. Uh, what do you think? What do you, what do you say to the people in first world countries like United States, people in democracies like, you know, first these capitalistic, free enterprise, freedom loving, entrepreneur loving ecosystems of people who maybe are born in them and they just take it for granted. If they, if, you know, they have no idea even watching the news, I don't think they have any idea, unless you've been to Cuba, Venezuela, North Korea, one of these, you know, so now Argentina, uh, one of these socialistic, communistic flavors of government. I don't know. I, I think I think people take it for granted. I'm a gringo, but I've been here in Miami for so many decades that I am like one with the Cuban people. So and I know the oppression that happens there and the choke points and the limitations. Uh, what's your take on that? I guess that's where I would love to start with you. I love it. I, it's a starting by the, in the beginning, I would say, you know, um, and it's good that you mentioned that because I want to uh, let's talk, let's touch on that and connect it to network marketing, because I think um, when I really understood network marketing, it was about freedom. That, that, that's what really, really, uh, um, you know, connected me with the, I would say emotionally, you know, with the, with the business, because like, like you said, I was born in Cuba and, um, I was raised in a in a in a Christian family, 
in Cuba, which it was like, you know, it is a communist country. So we have like a, these like two or three different layers of um, obstacles, you know, is it, just being in Cuba not in the late 60s, being born there, that was an obstacle in, in itself. But born in a, in a Christian family, uh, being like myself, a very rebellious person, you know, a, a young kid with a very uh, intellectual and spiritual, you know, uh, questions in that system, you know, just start adding up layers over layers from, you know, of uh, circumstances that come, comes down to your life. So that was my upbringing there. And then I, I really, I really wanted to 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 get out of Cuba and and, and to be free. Actually, I always tell this, um, and, and I think this summarized everything. When I was a little kid, let's say seven, eight, nine years old, when you ask me, "What do you want? What do you want to do when you are older?" You know, most kids would say, uh, "You know, a firefighter or doctor or whatever." policeman. When you ask me that, I say, I want to be free. I want a free man. I want to be a free man. To me, to be free was like a profession, you know, it was like a uh, a position in life or something like that. So um, I was, you know, since I was a very, very young, I was really fighting for my freedom, for the rights of being listened to. Um, and so that, that would that, that become part of my personality. And that's why I left my country. Uh, that that would be, I would say, a a a, a chapter in itself. Uh, maybe some some time in the future, um, because it was a long journey. You know, many difficult situations to be able to get out. Actually, I came out in a boat uh, with another nineteen Cuban people, uh, kids, women, men. My ex-wife was pregnant. My older. Daughter, she, was daddy, boat, she was on the boat with you. She was in the boat <clears> with <throat> me. And uh, my daughter, Laddie, uh, was born here in Miami 13 days after we made the trip from Cuba to Key West. So uh, that that's how crazy and that how hard the situation was, you know, that a couple will risk their life and their unborn child to to just just to just to be free. And so uh that was, you know, that would I would say that that is a, a very quick way to uh, describe in that desperation and that uh, desire, inner desire. When we're talking the business, you're talking about hunger and inner desire and uh, having a big why. And that was the big why, you know, as just to be free, you know, <clears throat> just to be free. Uh, and so when I think that if you ask me and I'm going to do like a little parenthesis here, uh, we immigrants, we have like a little leverage, I would say, because when we come here, we have nothing, we have nothing to lose. And so we work very hard to 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 prosper, to to uh, do things, you know, to do well in the country. And that's why you see so many immigrants doing not only naval marketing, but in, in any other businesses doing very well because they know the prices they, they have been through. They, they have they have to pay to be here and so they really give value to the opportunity that we have in the United States which is not a perfect country we know that but it's a it's a it's a country that gives you a lot of opportunities and if you are willing to do the work you really need to work in yourself um I mean there is so much that, that can be done and, and I agree with you I, I have met many many different um people that they were born in freedom and maybe because they were born having that, they don't value, you know, like any other thing in life. Sometimes when we have things that we have and work for it, uh, we don't give it the value. Uh, people that make a lot of money, we, we can see that in the industry, people that make a lot of money in a very short period of time and they waste all the money because they actually don't value, they didn't pay a price to to develop themselves to, to, to do, to, to create that, prosperity so it's the same thing you know many people born in the united states um they they were born in, into so many different opportunities and rights and just just the, just just being able to work to uh have a, a freedom of speech uh to have uh um basic needs being covered um you know 
uh, have a McDonald's restaurant in the corner, <laughs> you know, um, we take we take things for granted, you know. So that that you was know, my, I, that I was, was born I was born Madison, Wisconsin, beautiful little college town, two hundred thousand people maybe mm -hmm. when all the students are in town. <clears throat> Beautiful oak trees, elm trees, maple trees. Um, obviously, horrifically cold in the winter, which I hated. Uh, but it's a beautiful area of the country. But when I went to Hawaii for the first time, I was like breathless. I had never seen beauty like that. And then when I went to Alaska, same thing. First time, the, the mountain ranges, the stone. I landed on a glacier, you know, so I was out in the middle of the ocean standing on a glacier just so that I could say, yeah, I was on a glacier once in my life. But you just looked around every direction. And I always said, I, if I was born in one of those two places, I don't think I could appreciate the beauty. That's right. I just, I don't think I could. I don't think, if you're born in Hawaii or Fiji, or Tahiti, I, I just don't know you could do it. And so, you know, the funny thing about this podcast is it has a lot of unplanned benefits and uses. Uh, a lot of people use in segments from this different episodes and they play them for their key prospects because they want to show them what... Some people look at the business and say, oh, it's a little pin money business. You know, my my wife does that to make some extra money to buy some more purses. And they don't realize, no, there are women in this business who make $5 million a year running a multi-million dollar international company, mm -hmm. which would be the equivalent of one with thousands of employees, right? Um, things like that. And, and I think of your story you and your wife on the boat, Patty is unborn at that point. And, you know, we've got people saying, I'd have to buy a, a order for $200 to get started. I can't do that business. It's impossible. Uh, it's just like, how serious are you about your freedom? How serious are you about your dreams? Are you that, would you get on a boat and go 90 miles from Cuba over the Atlantic Ocean through the Florida Straits mm -hmm. with the idea you might even get capsized and drowned? And you don't know what's going to happen when you land. Uh, it's just so inspirational, your story. <laughs> Thank you, man. See, I um I totally agree with you. And uh what what I have what I have learned is that uh do you remember that uh uh, uh story, you know, the master that the disciple is asking him uh what his wisdom looks like, and the guy takes the the, the student into, into the water and put his his head under the water and is desperate going for oxygen, and then when you desire uh Wisdom, as you as you were desiring oxygen, then you will understand what wisdom really is. And I, I think that everyone has read that um, story. It's the same thing. It just is is what comes to mind. You know, I was so um, I was so desperate. You know, for freedom, just just to be able to speak, just to be able to express my idea, to uh, debate my idea, to do whatever I wanted not to have a uh, person or an institution telling me what I needed to do or think or, you know, where to sleep, where to sleep or what to eat. Um, when you really are desperate for that, then you really value uh, the, the, the type of freedom that we have in, uh, in a non-perfect, um, uh, <laughs> non-perfect capitalist country like United States or any other uh, similar country that we have the opportunity to to live in. So I think that's exactly what what the, the best way that I can describe it. You know, mm 
And so we did that trip. And that trip, you know, I'm 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 doing this short version, you know, that was like that was 17 hours in the in the in the ocean. It was very uh it was very dangerous. It was a storm coming up from the north, you know, the boat almost um uh, uh uh roll over it, you know, uh a few times. It was very, very scary, you know. Uh people screaming, uh, you know. Uh, I I I say my prayers a few times, <laughs> yeah. uh, thinking that was the last minute, that was the last second of my life, you know. And so when you are so close, it's, it's like people that they have a, a you know a heart attack or a stroke and they survive it and they become very healthy and they become very you know purpose driven and they really find a new meaning to life. It's about that, you know. It's it's about finding those experiences and. You know, unfortunately, most people need to have uh, that type of experience to really value what they have. You know, I, I hope that many people would be able to listen to the story or any other story and get inspired and go for the goals and do whatever needs to be done within themselves and in the business to create what they really want to, to create, you know. Do you ever just, you're talking to some young, entitled lazy person who takes everything for granted do you ever just want to grab them by the lapel and shake them and slap them into next week <laughs> <laughs> absolutely more than that actually when i was living in colombia uh, i was invited to speak in a in a university in a college <clears throat> i was talking about you know a, a business it was a it was a business uh talk you know don't, nothing to do with politics you know but I was in the, this conference and one of the kids, you know, with a Che Guevara t-shirt. Oh, my God. Asked me, uh, this is a real story, you know, asked me about why I left Cuba and I betrayed my country and blah, 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 blah. And I really, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm here to talk about, you know, uh, business mindset. I'm here to talk about uh, strategic planning <laughs> was my topic at that conference. I'm not here to talk about politics. So I really didn't want to engage into it. But then the kid started doing it. And then another kid stand up and two or three of these young students, you know, in Latin America, you know, um, they started to uh, confront in that, that thing. And then I asked, you know, the organizer, and I say, can I speak what I think? Or say, yeah, yeah, I speak what you say. And I, you know, put three or four ideas together. And I actually uh, was very, uh, um, um, driven to explain to them, like you said, you know, like what you have and 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 what you're missing and, and missing the point. And it was, there was so much uh, confrontation that they actually shut down the the thing and they took me over and they fin finished the whole thing. I mean, actually, I was escorted out from the from this college and I was <laughs> wow. I was suspended from my uh, my conference just because I I told them you know uh, how uh -huh. how how the things were um, and and it was very and I'm gonna put this out there it was it was very um, it was very uh, complicated the situation because this was like a high class university with kids that they their fathers are rich people you know and they have the money to pay for this type of uh, high level education in this country. And I just started just explaining to them how fortunate they are because in their same country, they have other, you know, hundreds of thousands of kids that they, they don't have the opportunity to go to that type of access to that type of education and so forth. And then I started, and then the college was like, you know, the people from the university, <laughs> like <laughs> you're getting into, you're gonna get us into trouble, you know, with the uh, with the families and, and so forth. So. Um, it was very, you know, it was, a, and I have, you know, that happened to me a lot of times, uh, especially in South America, uh, because there is a lot of uh, influence from the left, you know, uh, uh, ideology. I, actually, uh, parenthesis, I'm not into, into politics. I, I, you know, I go about my business. I, I forgot, I, for, I did my forgiveness process about everything that I suffered back in Cuba and I healed all that, um, resentment and hate and and uh, um, pain that I had about that experience and actually took the positive of it and uh you know and I and I embraced that so I, I'm not here to 
to uh, talk bad about any political ideas or any other uh, political positions. You know, I'm not, usually I don't get into that, but if you, <laughs> if you get into my nerve, um, <laughs> I will, I'm, I'm going to respond and I'm going to tell you what I think with all due respect, but I, I, I do have, I, I usually I don't express those ideas uh, publicly. I'm not into confrontational politics. I, I, I usually what I do in my speeches and my coaching sessions and my business and my social media, I talk about, you know, personal development and spirituality and leadership and so forth. I don't get into politics or anything like that. But sometimes you need to, you know, stand stand up and, you know, and and make your point clear, you know, with all due respect. Yeah, 100%. Okay, what's like first on your list that uh, you brought stuff you want to talk about? Well, actually, one of the things I, it's going to be a very, um, you know, 180 degrees um, um, topic here. But one of the things that I wanted to not ask you because we have talked about it before, but I think that would be very uh, interesting to talk, you know, uh, with the audience is network marketing and spirituality you know um I, I don't know many many people maybe don't know but we met each other in a in a in a in a uh, uh, in a spiritual community you know more than 20 years ago and uh, we shared that common um philosophy life philosophy or uh, or sensitivity about our spiritual life and at the same time, we are both passionate about business and network marketing in particular. So um, how do you put those two together? What, what, what do you see the spiritual principles that we share applied into network marketing? And this will be a very good clip for your <laughs> uh, spiritual friends that or or, or um, network marketers that have a spiritual friend get interested into the business, <laughs> interested to have that conversation. Yeah, I think I think my career as a professional speaker was also paralleled with my career as a network marketer. Uh, I became a network marketer first. I became successful. Then I started to teach it. Um, and then I, but when I first was doing professional speaking, it was with network marketing. Then I kind of broadened out and I started talking about marketing in general because companies and other firms would, or organizations would want to bring me in. And so I just talk about marketing stuff because I was a really good marketer and had been pretty successful. And one day I came into my office and I told my vice president, uh, I'm going to sell the company. I don't want to do, if I have to do one more speech about how to get a prospect's phone number, I'm going to stick a fork in my eye. Uh, I just, I'm old enough now. I got enough money. I'm going to race cars and play softball and drink out of a coconut. So I sold my product, all the books and audios and video albums and everything. I sold that business to my buddy Ford Sakes. And that was it. I retired. Uh, I think I was 40 years old. So I was right on schedule for my first midlife crisis, you know. So I was just retired. And uh, so my friend... Bill Gove, who was the first president of the National Speakers Association, and he lived here and we had met in the Florida Speakers Association and he just adopted me. I don't know why he just loved me and kind of took me under his wing and he was like the father I didn't have. I just adored him and respected him and he was an incredible speaker. Uh, so he tells me, we got to meet for lunch. So we meet for lunch and he says, you are the greatest speaker in the world. And I know because I used to be him. And you need to be on the platform. It's a sin that you're not 
doing speeches. I still, I get like goosebumps just remembering this story. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. I couldn't, no one else in the world could have told me that. I would have never heard it from anyone. But from Bill, I started processing it. And so I was out jogging on the, what's the South Causeway, the, you know, where I used to live by Sunset Harbor there, the one that goes across the Little Islands. I used to do my cardio running across it. So I'm doing my cardio the next few days, running across the bridges and kind of grinding my molars, thinking about what Bill told me. And I was like, if I'm going to speak again, it has to be about the stuff that I care about. I'm, I just, I don't want to do, how do you get a prospect's phone number? I just wasn't put on this earth to teach that. I believe in free enterprise. I believe in network marketing. But I, you know, I think it's a microcosm for life. And one of the things that I had done over the last few years before I retired was I was trying to sneak in the prosperity stuff. Because along the way, I discovered Unity on the Bay, which is the spiritual community you mentioned where we met. Mm -hmm. And I was being exposed to Reverend Charles Fillmore and uh, Ernest Holmes and Catherine Ponder and Emily Cady, Eric Butterworth. So these spiritual titans we had, of course, our minister there was a guy mm -hmm. named Earl Cameron, who was just a mystic, a biblical mystic. Um, and so I had been studying the principles of prosperity and applying them in my network marketing business and my regular business. And that really accelerated my wealth building because what it really did was it accelerated my character development my skill sets, who I was becoming. It spoke to me and caused me to seek to be a higher version of myself. And so I had spent a couple of years, like, so we would do a mailing, you know, Randy's going to teach you the marketing techniques, how to da, 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 da. And then I would get there and I'd be saying, but you got to do daily self-development and you got to get your mindset right. And you got to build up your self-awareness and your self-esteem. And so I was always kind of sneaking it in the back door. And so after that conversation, and plus just to be, you know, totally transparent with everybody, I was going crazy being retired. It was driving me nuts. You can only drive your Viper so many times a day. You can only play in, I think I was at five different softball leagues a week at one point. You know, you can only drink out of so many coconuts. And you just say, is this all there is? Isn't there something with a little more meaning? So Bill was the right person with the right message. And so I came back and I said, no, I'm going to teach the principles of prosperity. And I wrote my Why You're Dumb, Sick, and Broke and How to Get Smart, Healthy, and Rich book, which was a very amateur, uh, early attempt at putting together my philosophy on prosperity. And then I wrote the five book prosperity series and I started teaching those. Uh, and it was kind of the same thing in my network marketing journey along the way, because I just remember struggling so much for people who don't know my story. I lost money for five years. I was going to event after event, buying tickets and to events and tools and going crazy. And so I'm like, I got to get around these leaders. I got to find out what they know that I don't know. I have to the find secret. Out. Yeah, the secret. What, how, what are they thinking that I'm not the thinking about? Formula. Yeah, what's the what are they seeing that I'm not seeing? So I volunteer to be, uh, a, you know, help out at events and set the room up or break the room down or pick up guest speakers from the airport and bring them to the event. And so I got to sit in on some of that stuff. And they were talking about books, the magic of thinking big, think and grow rich. 
as a man thinketh. At that point, I'd never heard anything about those books. I was an avid, voracious reader as a kid. That's what saved my life, I believe, because I was, I developed a love to read because for people who don't know, I'm on the spectrum. I have a astronomically high IQ uh, and was terrible in school and always being sent to the principal's office or the counselor's office and, you know, not because they couldn't engage my learning desire in a way that didn't bore me to tears. So my release was reading. So I would read a book a day. I read the entire Hardy Boy series. It's, you know, in weeks, I read the entire Nancy Drew detective series, the uh, Agatha Christie, Hercule, Hercule Poirot and Miss Marple or Miss whatever. I think it was Miss Marple. Um, so, but they were all fiction. I didn't even know there was nonfiction books. So now I'm around these leaders. And when they talk about as a man thinketh, they're talking about it with reverence. When they talk about think and grow rich, it was like this was the rock star of books. I never heard anyone talk about books like that. Books that like what an impact they had on their lives. And I think that's the one of the most unique blessings and gifts of network marketing is self-development is kind of baked in the cake. I have been president of the Chamber of Commerce. I have served on many nonprofit boards. I owned the hairstyling shop. I published a magazine. I owned a retail store. I ran restaurants. I owned a couple of restaurants. I've looked, you know, I consulted with other businesses. I've I have seen the, you know, I'm an entrepreneur since I was 15 years old because I came from a family. If I wanted, uh, I would have loved the 10 speed bike. I couldn't make that happen. But for to even get a three speed bike, I had to go out, rake leaves, shovel snow, babysat, do whatever to earn that money. My mom didn't have money to give us stuff like that. So I, I was an entrepreneur since I was a teen. And so I know a little something about business and I have never seen any other industry, any other profession that the self-development is so intertwined with the, the operation of the business. Uh, give all the credit to the OGs, the original gangsters from Amway, because they really set that culture, I believe, for the whole profession. Dexter Yeager and Bill Britt and Georgia and Georgia Lee and Ron Perrier and those OGs of the the you know the gangster days of Amway, they had that book of the month, tape of the week program, and they created that culture and pretty much the entire industry stole the idea from them and put it into place. And all of us in the business today were beneficiaries of those early Amway pioneers who did that. And um, as part of the, you know, your question was really about spirituality as more than it was self-development. But I think they, it's just was the natural progression, right? When you start to study self-development and personal growth, you start to think of, this the the spiritual connections the the timeless questions who am i what am i here for what is the meaning of life is there a god um so you get seduced into studying buddhism zen christianity lds um hindu doctrines the concept of karma uh, the eightfold, the covenant, the Jewish covenant, the eightfold Buddhist path, right? You you just get intrigued by these schools of thought or these philosophies of thought. 
Um, and it's so, I, I am having dinner tonight with two clients, corporate, ex, you know, an owner and a president of a company I work with. So they're here in Miami. They're bringing me my Christmas present, which is they're taking me to the Miami Dolphins uh, Bills game tomorrow night. Okay. Determine the AFC championship, right? So they got to, you know, they spent like $2,000 each for tickets and they're flying here to, that's my Christmas present that they, you know, they're so grateful that I, I work with Ann Feinstein with them and we've just, we're just killing it. We're just, we introduce some tools and some training and some systems and they're just blowing up growth. Like they haven't seen in years and years. Um, so they're coming here for that. And, and what I'm giving them for their Christmas present is to have a book for each of them. Now they're both uh, latter day saints, what we used to call Mormons. Uh, one of whom, you know, very well, Jeff Higginson. Oh so, my God. So I got big Higgy. Frank. Yes. So big Higgy and Travis, who's the owner of the company, the company's Rain International. So there, you know, I'm going to have dinner with them tonight and then we're going to the game tomorrow night. So for their Christmas present, for Jeff, what I did is, uh, you know, because here's the funny thing about um, presents, right? Uh, if you ever read any of those love languages or relationship books, they, one of the, foundations you see is people give what they want to receive of course that's why guys get into trouble every valentine's day when they give their wife a power drill <laughs> you know <laughs> some shit and the, she's like what the fuck <laughs> you know but he's thinking oh my god i would love if somebody gave me a black and decker drill i bet my wife will love this it's just kind of a human nature we give what we want to receive Right. Which is really why we're going to the Dolphin game tomorrow night, because that's what Jeff wants to do is go to a football game because he's a football coach. Right. Um, and I love it. I'll have a great time. But I'm a baseball guy. Right. We give what we want to receive. So and or we give what we think someone we know they would like and want to buy. So I approach it a little differently. So I've got these two Mormons and what I'm giving them for Christmas is I'm giving Travis uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, his book, The, the Miracle of Mindfulness. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's this uh, Buddhist monk um, that I'm giving this book to, this very devout LDS guy, just because he's like me, him and I have, Travis and I are like, we must have been twins separated at birth. We're both on the spectrum. We're both mind goes a hundred thousand miles an hour you know we can't calm let me not affirm that in the past we perhaps couldn't calm down or relax or meditate or thing so this book the miracle of mindfulness was really helpful to me so and it's the kind of book travis would never think to buy in a million years because it's not in his ecosystem but i think it's going to be really amazing for him and then for jeff who is a, I don't know what they call it in the Mormon church. He's a pastor or a lay minister or something, but he's like, he, Neither. he volunteers like 30 hours a week in the church. He has a flock he ministers to, he gives counseling to those people. So I'm giving him the latest book from Jack Cornfield, which is titled After Ecstasy, The Laundry. <laughs> and it's this fascinating book about how spiritual leaders, uh, priests and rabbis and lamas and Dalai Lamas and gurus, you know, how do they deal with the real world when they go to India and they study with some master for three years and they become enlightened and they come back to the West and now they got to deal with the subway and the groceries and the laundry and the whatever. And then what are the problems of ministering a flock? And, you know, look how many uh, spiritual leaders end up becoming cult leaders 
And then it's like they control the people, they manipulate the people, they turn them into sex cults, you know, all kind of crazy shit can happen if you don't stay grounded. Um, so Jack has written this really fascinating book about how you balance humanity and spirituality. And I thought, oh my God, for Jeff, who is this ministering to this flock every week, this would be an, another one, another case of, this is a book he would never think to buy in a million years. He would go out and he would buy a book by Bill Belichick or Noel, what's his name? Nick Saban, the coach at Alabama. You know, he'd get a, a coach's book and he would want it. But I didn't want to give those guys gifts like that. I wanted to give them gifts that I felt really would mean something to them, a, a gift that they would have never get from anywhere else or ever thought to get. And I think that's kind of the, the evolution of this discussion that you raised about this connection in our business with spirituality. I think we get on that self-development path and then it takes us to the spiritual realm very dangerous, by the way, we need to say this. When you're a leader, you, and this is where I think the Amway guys jumped the shark, some of them, because they would do their major events and, you know, it would get to be Sunday and then they say, okay, now we've given you all of the business building, how to make money, how to be successful. But if you want the real stuff on how to be successful, then you have to come back after the break for our special session. And that was the come to Jesus section. And so, you know, you'd have Hindus or Buddhists or Jews and they would come to the session and they were trying to convert them to Christianity. And that was not very, I mean, it's not for me to judge. That's how they wanted to run their business. And they decided they were okay with whatever business they might lose or people they might alienate because they really believe in their heart of hearts that Jesus is the only, you know, way to the kingdom and blah, blah. Um, but I would caution my team and I do, Hey, I love that you found faith, whether you're LDS, whether you're Buddhist, whether you're Hindu, uh, but don't try to shove that down the throat of your team because you are going to alienate people. And where I feel the responsibility is, I've got um, Abraham on my ninth level and he brings his people to the event or he brings his candidate to the event. And then I want to advertise my faith, my particular religion. I'm messing with his income. His candidates may say, uh, why, how dare you bring me to something which to them might be even considered sacrilegious. <laughs> Um, and I've heard his business and it's not my right to hurt his business. My, my job as a leader, your job as a leader, everyone who watches this, our job is to protect our team, to help them grow their team. And so I think we, it's important. We, we can share the lessons we learn from spiritual principles. Um, but we got to do it with nuance with discernment and with respect. We have to respect other people's faiths and people of no faith. And we need to um, try to present what the things we found helpful in a spiritual sense and do it in a way that doesn't threaten people. And then I think that would be the true spirit of most religions, I think. Well, thank you. That was very uh, <clears throat> um, eloquent. I would say I'm very inspiring as well. I think I, I totally agree with you. And um, um, just wanted to add, I, I, I do believe that uh, regardless of any religion, that's what I say, the spirituality, I didn't touch in any religious or uh, yeah, religion, uh, a specific religion. Because what I the, the, the reason that I wanted to ask you that is because I know about all this side of Randy Gage as a spiritual, you know, teacher, I would say, or author, um, that I 
I know many, many people within the uh, uh, network marketing industry do not know about that um, aspect, I would say, of your of your work. And, and I really encourage for the people that they are, that they are already into a, a spiritual growth process to seek out your uh, your books and your you know the programs that you have, because to me it was very uh, were very inspiring. And uh, when I got to network marketing, one of the things that I really uh, connected with was precisely the point that, and and I, and I think the reason that the you know the old Amway guys and the whole you know um, uh, educational system within the different companies I do believe that they, there is a lot of connection with the uh, with the process of reprogramming our consciousness because I would say 99.9 percent of people out there they were not programmed to be a diamond director in a you know direct sales company they're not they're simply not. And so I think that's why I would say most companies that we have some kind of a, the personal development, spiritual development process, because we need to help people to transform their consciousness so they can actually function within the network marketing industry. Because the network marketing industry, I believe, is such a prosperous business, like you said before, like a lady, you know, and in, in, in her house with the kids can run a five million dollars a year business. To me, that's prosperity. And if she's not um, uh, spiritually mind ready, you know, to that, she doesn't have the right mentality to do that. She's not going to do it. Even though when she has the business, have a good company and has the, uh, the business to do it, uh, she's not going to be mentally ready uh, to do it. So I, I I do believe that this is a 95% um mindset business uh, because of the nature of the business, because there are no requirements on studies or background or connections or money or where you live and any any of that. And we all are big kids. We know that. Um, and I think the only, you know, the, the, our main job would be to help people to develop their consciousness, to grow. To That's why personal development so, is so important because is is the is the door is the key that can open that door to to really um to really grow into the business to really uh suck in all the uh, opportunity that the um the business brings with itself you know so uh, to me that's very important so you have really was was agile your first company yeah actually it was agile my first company as okay. a distributor you know, I, I work with different companies as a, you know, as a consultant, as, you know, coach, whatever. But Agile was my first, was my first rodeo. <laughs> and you, when I met you there at Unity and Agile, you were an architect, weren't you? Yes. I, yeah. I was an architect and a coach at that time. So you've really um, expanded the coaching stuff with what you're doing now. Absolutely. Talk about that, please. What you know? What are you doing with all that? Uh, but actually, you know that that's one of those you know simple stories where you see many people in the industry, like myself, that they can actually move in the direction of their goal, their you know the passion, because of the industry. So I was I was an architect, and I have my business, and I have um, I was working with different clients, but I really was passionate about the coaching thing and teaching and helping people. And I was doing um, different courses and, and having some, some clients and that. And so when I got into, into the business with Agile, that actually gave me the uh, income and the, the, the flexibility to be able to pursue my, my coaching career with more time and, and do not have to worry about the, the money side of it. And so that that to me was was liberating, you know, the fact that I could do my agile, in this case, my network marketing business, you know, 20 hours a week and then another 20, 25, 30 hours a week devoted to my clients into my coaching practice. And so that really opened me, opened many doors for me um, business-wide, professionally. 
Uh, so that that was that was a, the the greatest gift, or one of the greatest gifts that I that I got from the industry was the uh, opportunity to really follow my my passion into the coaching system. And the coaching you're doing now, the your it's a lot of network marketing people, but it's also not network. You know, kind of talk about what your practice looks like today. Um. I would say that probably only 35 30 25% of the people that I coach and the and the companies that I that I that I consult with are network marketing companies maybe 20% of them most of them are not network marketing companies or are not, not not network marketing you know clients they are business owners I do a lot of uh, consulting with business owners uh managers you know high level um uh people in different multinational companies for or private sector that they really want to um, expand their vision, expand the business, doing this inner work and, you know, changing their mindset. And, and so what I do is like a, like a personal business coaching, I would say um, 70% of that is, is, is with companies and, you know, institutions and government institutions and private companies and all of that corporations. And then at 30% of my clients are private clients, you know, people that they really want that uh, executive coaching. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much what I do. And, um, and since I have been in this growth process with uh, personal development and the spirituality and all of that, I have been incorporating some of those spiritual teachings to help people to really, you know, have a holistic approach to life and to really grow businesses and you know i would say uh grow businesses as they grow as person and they grow their life you know so they, the business grow in a in a very organic way you know instead of uh doing this uh duality where many people they are very successful in their business but they are they have a miserable life you know or family life or whatever so try to see life more in a in a, in a in a in a balanced way, you know. So that's that's what I'm doing right now, and doing my network marketing business as well. So when you're coaching the network marketing people, what are the big issues you're seeing today? What are you What are your clients stuck on when they come to you? What are Where are they looking for help the most? Um. I think it's mindset, you know, bottom line. At the end of the day, I don't know about you. I wanted to ask you that question, actually. That was one of the questions that I had. Um, I believe it's, it's a mindset, it's a mindset uh, thing um, because you, you can have... Uh, you can have a very good network marketing company you can have a good product, a good compensation plan, a good marketing team. Uh, but if you're not having the right mindset, uh, mindset, right focus, uh, if you don't have the right consciousness, I would say um, it's very hard to, to really grow into the business, you know? Um, so I would say that most of the people that I work with has a individual is more like uh, working in their mindset, their habits, their you know paradigms in terms in terms of consciousness. What what is what is that is really holding them you know down internally more than actually in the uh, outside of the uh, you know the the infrastructure logistics you know st strategic thing on the business. So I would say that the. Uh, I would say that's the main issue, you know, where, where we, in my case, where I, the people that I, that I, that I work with uh, individually, you know, they are, you know, I would say mid to high level uh, leaders and they, they know they have the uh, capacity of moving higher in their company and having, you know, higher results. Um, and they just, you know, they they just deserve they need this this uh, uh help to coach them to 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 help them to 
to broke those barriers, you know, we see within themselves. And I would say our, probably 20% of it has to do with uh, helping them create uh, the right training program, the right tool, the right um, culture, you know, with the, within their teams. And um, <clears throat> so some of the uh, uh, corporations or companies that I consult with within the industry is more like that. It's more like, you know, what, what do you have in these different systems and, and what tools do you need and what is the... Uh, the overall philosophy and the uh, they're gonna do an international expansion. So what we need to do, what we need to do to do that, and, and so forth. So it's more into the strategic, tactical uh, aspect of the business. Um, but I would say eighty percent is just mindset, man. It's, it's just like you and me, like anyone else. You know, <laughs> we are our main subject of a study and our main subject of work that this is what we need to do the rest of, of our lives you know to yeah. keep working and working in ourselves yeah what so your experience one of the i'm gonna bring back the question to you uh one of the questions that i had for you was um in the industry in the industry there is a lot of what i call uh, basic knowledge trainers. You know, there is a lot of people that they can t teach you how to do a phone call, how to do a presentation and so forth. Um, but I think just because I'm your friend, I'm, I'm being always very close to you. You have been my mentor within the industry. I think one of the, um, one of the um, uh, characteristics that you have as a mentor is that you have this capacity of, helping people grow from very good to excellent, you know, going from $1 million a year to 5 million, you know, and there are not too many people that can do that. <laughs> and so I think that's one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, things that make you really different uh, in the industry, if not the best, one of the best in doing that. And I would say, what is your process on that? Uh, when you have these key players in the company, top five people, and they they know they are capable of, you know, triplicating the set of the company. And um, and I know the work that you do is, is more like working with them. So what would be, uh, for those key players, what would be the process? What is that you see, you know, more, more, most common? The, the barriers, the, the, the block, the, um, the breakthroughs? Well, luckily, this is long form content because <laughs> uh, like for people who are just here for the first time, this we don't do Instagram stories here or reels, you know, YouTube shorts. This we have some of these go two hours, three hours because we want the real in-depth uh, conversations. And this question you pose, you know, I might go for the next six hours. I don't know. We'll see if I run out of energy. I, I have coffee here <laughs> and I have water. So, <laughs> yeah, because so many things come to mind when you raise that subject. Um, first of all, you, we're 100% in agreement on the mindset being the foundation, right? The If I talk about what am I coaching people on for prosperity? You remember I used to do a prosperity class at Unity on the Bay. During the pandemic, I did the prosperity unchurch. Mm -hmm. um, for people who are interested, by the way, you just go to my YouTube channel, Prosperity TV, and I've got a year's worth of un sermons or un services so every weekend during the pandemic when everybody was locked down i did this like basically a a service on the principles of prosperity and so th for that kind you of you get work, to spanish is is all done in spanish as well um with, with jorge remember with subtitles no remember that we created the same content we did it Oh, yeah. So you were doing it. Yeah, you were always doing. Yeah. Like, what's the you have to send me the link. I'll put it in the show notes for okay. the 
if you guys were doing like one week later, you would do the Spanish version. I had completely mm -hmm. forgot about that. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, yeah. So it was a really learning process for us, you know, uh, working in that project with you. Yeah, well, so when I look at that aspect of my work, which I believe is my real work, I always tell all my corporate clients, I tell my team, even though I make all this money and I tell them, this is still my side gig. My day job is I'm a prosperity coach. <laughs> That's what I was put on this earth to do, right? So when I look at my work in the prosperity arena, 95% of the people who come to me, I think the issue is worthiness. So the worthiness issue is what's holding them back. They're getting it from organized religion. They were programmed that... They were born a sorry sinner or they were reincarnated this lifetime to pay penance because they were a camel thief in the last lifetime. Or they're here seeking enlightenment in this lifetime number 112, but they won't really reach enlightenment until they get to lifetime number 198. Um, they were abused physically sexually, mentally, or all of the above as a child. So their self-esteem is in the basement from that. Mm -hmm. uh, today, the biggest issue is social media. There, if you, you got 12 year old girls who are spending four hours a day on TikTok. You got 17 year old guys who are spending six hours a day on social media. Um, that social media is tearing down their self-esteem. It's telling them they're not tall enough, strong enough, blonde enough. Their skin isn't good enough. They need um, liposculpture and plastic surgery and a no job and puff out your lips so you look like a fish and Botox to cover every wrinkle and all of this superficial bullshit that is just destroying people's self-esteem um you got governments who need you to be needy so they tear you down they put you in no-win scenarios where you are dependent on them so you have all of these influences which are destroying your self-esteem and so even though on a conscious level you want to become healthy and happy and prosperous on a subconscious level you have so much programming if you're a 12 year old girl the ccp has programmed you through tiktok to hate yourself and you're never going to let yourself be happy until you recognize that brainwashing that programming that you have that you don't even know is there your subconscious is smarter than you are. Your subconscious is stronger than you are. Your subconscious knows more about you than you do. And you can't outrun your subconscious. Nobody can. The most aware person, you know, I'm a high IQ person with a high level of self-awareness. I do daily self-development. And yet I know I cannot compete with the computer algorithms that are designed to beat me down. And this is why I left Facebook and Instagram. And, um, you know, I, I'd spend an hour a week on X uh, and I read select blogs and follow select people uh, and really ration my exposure to what I call the data sphere, which is all of these things that are brainwashing you and programming you. And so that's where you have to start, that the, the belief that you deserve to be successful. Because again, you, 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 you say that, you think that, you believe you know that on the conscious level, but the subconscious level you don't even recognize the how insidious, how pervasive 
that bad negative programming is. And so you've got to counter program it. You've got to limit your exposure to the bad programming. You've got to um, blow up. You've got to dig deep. You've got to find some of those uh, limiting beliefs that you're programmed with, and you have to blow them up to the nothingness from which they came. You have to counter program against them. And then you've got to uh, expose yourself to positive, empowering programming. Uh, like those books that I'm giving my friends for Christmas. You you got to read stuff like that. You have to listen to podcasts of self-development and personal growth and prosperity. Um, I'll put in a plug. I have a, a podcast that, you know, I'm, I've pulled out of social media. I'm not doing that stuff. I'm on a sabbatical now, but I still have a podcast with hundreds of episodes on it called the Power Prosperity Podcast. So if you're not a subscriber, go check that out. So that's where I start. Um, the next part of the process, I think, for the breakthroughs that I'm able to achieve for people with them, with their companies, with their teams, to take those people from a million to five million, like you mentioned, is the system and the process stuff. You know, why are my clients so delighted with me? Um, they sign multi-million dollar contracts, right? I have benchmarks in my contracts for half million dollar bonuses, $750,000 bonuses, million dollar bonuses. I have some contracts now with uh, $1.5 million bonuses to when companies get to certain parameters. They love <laughs> to write me those checks, right? They, it's a big deal because they know what they're doing. So I, you know, what I'm able to do with them, through them, together with them is to set up the systems. You know, why is our Travis Perry who's and Jeff Higginson here this weekend? They're so delighted with the systems that Ann and I have put in place for their company. So they have a sizzle video, an intrigue video that people can watch and pre-qualify them. Are they a candidate or are they not? If they are a candidate, are they a candidate for the product line? Are they a candidate for the business? Then you have another you know, tool in the process. Okay, if they're a candidate for the product, you show them this video or you give them this catalog or this magalog. They're a candidate for the business. You send them to this online presentation or you do a home meeting thing or you do a one-on-one -on -one with the flip chart or you have this PowerPoint and we create a standardized presentation and it's in all those channels. It's there with video. It's there in PowerPoint. It's there with a flip chart. One-on-one, -on -one, home meeting, hotel meeting, online meeting, standardized presentation is the same. Uh, you know, my mantra is automate, systematize, scale. Mm -hmm. Automate, systematize, scale. Automate, systematize, scale. Everything, you know, my... Uh, you got to say, okay, if somebody was on my 25th generation and they have never met me in person, would they be able to duplicate the results of this action that I'm taking? So it might be an action to make a presentation to a candidate, or it could be some kind of training program you're doing for the team. But again, could that person on your 25th level who never met you, Maybe they saw you at the convention, you were on stage, or they watched you on a live stream or something, but they never met you. Would they be able to do that? And uh, there's so much bad, there's, there, there are so many bad premises in our business. There's so many people with the bad premises of people are stupid, people are lazy, nobody wants to work. I can't find any motivated people. That's all self-limiting bullshit. It's all self-limiting story that you made up. And because you believe it, it's true. But if you didn't believe it, it wouldn't be true. Because I have proved un indisputably, without a shadow of a doubt, of a doubt 
that if you really give people a system they can run with, if you really give them external source tools that allow them to be duplicated, if you give them the events and the structure and the training on how to use the system, how to use the tools, the vast majority of them will do the work. The vast majority of them want to be successful and they're willing to pay the price. The reason your people aren't calling candidates is because they don't feel confident calling a candidate. They haven't been provided with a skill set and a level of confidence that they could do that. So they don't do it. They procrastinate. They look for distractions. So, and you know me, you follow my work since your first day as an agile distributor. You know, I am Mr. System. Mr. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just my eat, breathe, and sleep, the system stuff. It's all about process. Um, and then I would put one more element in. I told you this is going to be a long answer. Uh, yeah. What I see today is the distraction factor of stupid shit. What is the stupid shit distraction going on right now? Social media, personal branding, artificial intelligence. It's, you have so many trainers who aren't even in the business. They were never in the business or they were in the business back in the cassette tape days and they haven't built a team ever since. Or they were in the business and they washed out. And now they're a guru. Now they wrote a book. Now they do seminars. Uh, and they're teaching it's all about you, your personal brand. And you got to build up your brand and you build up your social media profile. And, and so they have people who are so distracted with building their personal brand, their business dies because nobody can duplicate them. Um, I, I think social media is a very helpful tool. I, I have earned, let's be... Total transparent here. I have earned millions of dollars in commissions from volume produced by people that I met on social media. But I'm off social media right now. I left it. I left it for my mental health, for my mental state that I'm like, no, I, you know, we all have to choose which games we want to play. And that's a game I don't want to play right now. If I was brand new and I was starting a business from scratch today, I would be on social media. That's why I was on social media. I didn't join social media because I wanted to send out tweets and tell people what I had for lunch. I'm the last person on earth who would have ever been on social media, right? If I wasn't built, if I wasn't an author who felt a responsibility to promote my books, to thank my publishers for giving me big advances and investing in my books, I would have never got on social media, right? Um, but I did, and I did, and it was helpful for me as I grew my business in my early years. Um, but now it's gone out of control. If you, if somebody tells me, yeah, I just got this guy, he has 4 million followers on TikTok. He joined my team. He's going to, you know, I'm like, oh, shit, I know where this, I know how this story ends up. Mr. Super Influencer is going to be the number one recruiter in the company for the next four months. He's going to have the highest volume for the next four months. Uh, my enrollee who sponsored him or her is going to make a good amount of income, depending on how the type of the comp plan is and whether they're qualified in other things. And by five months, six months from now, that influencer will have left. Uh, if people only knew how relentless and tiresome and all-encompassing it is to be a social media influencer, they would never want to do it. Mm -hmm. the, those people with 5 million followers on YouTube, 4 million followers on Instagram or TikTok, 
They are full-time, 100-hour-a-week grinders looking for sponsors, looking for affiliate deals, desperately creating new content, trying to post 27 times a day. They never can shut their business down. They have no residual income, anything. If people in MLM knew what those influencers have to do to be influencers, they would never want to be influencers. And if those influencers, those people with 5 million followers on social media, if they knew the power of leverage and residual income and security that they could get in a network marketing, just a mid-level distributorship, they would close all of their social media accounts tomorrow, right? So when somebody calls me up and you know, oh, so I got this guy, he's got 5 million followers. I'm, I'm like, oh, shit. Don't you know any housewives? You know, find me a housewife who's got three kids and sponsor her. Because six months from now, your TikTok guy is going to be long gone. And your homemaker, she might have 5,000 people on her team. And 15 years from now, she's going to have 100,000 people on her team. And she's going to have this multi-million dollar international business like is the equivalent of running a, a division of IBM or AT&T or something. And she's going to be doing it at home, homeschooling her kids. That's the potential, right? So, the so now, again, there's ways to use social media. I've Go to duplicationnation.com. I've got courses I've done with Jaime Lokier. We've done symposiums. There's smart ways to do this. Look at my books. I talk about ways you can do social media. Mm -hmm. But the biggest issue right now is these gurus who are teaching people that you're just going to do social media at home in your bunny slippers and you're going to be a multimillionaire and you don't have to go out in the real world and you don't have to meet real people and you don't have to work. You don't have to, you know. Uh, Anne Feinstein and I were talking the other day, one of her people is she was running all these ads on social media for struggling network marketers. If you're a struggling network marketer, call me. I can. So she's been sponsoring all these people. And now they're all calling her every day, complaining and whining because they're struggling. Well, of course they're struggling. That's what you recruit them on. He <laughs> said, if you're a struggling network marketer, call me. So now she's got a bunch of struggling network marketers on her team. You know, be very careful what you ask for, right? There's ways to do social media where you don't create that result. You always have to ask, you know, there's only one excuse for a bad team, and that's a bad leader. Sorry, it's not President Biden. It's not Donald Trump. It's not the economy. It's not your sponsor. It's not your company. The only excuse for a bad team is a bad leader. So if you have a bad team, let me be the one to break the news to you. Go in the bathroom, look in the mirror, and have a conversation with that person because that's the only way you're going to break it out, right? So um, back to this topic at hand, though, more laser focused, is so many people are getting seduced with crazy social media stuff. Uh, you know, now it's, you know, our Joan Act just sent me a, a, a video this morning, literally right before you and I started talking, he sent me a video of Eric Worre doing a training on some new AI intelligence tool. And I'm like, oh my God, it's just distraction, distraction, distraction. There will be a place and a time for AI. There's a place and a time for chat GPT. There's uses for this stuff right now. But the people who are teaching it right now, they have no clue what they're talking about. They're doing it. Here, here would be something, you know, you, I, yeah, it's in the new book that you're, you're proofreading right now. Mm -hmm. uh, or reviewing, I should say, you're not proofreading, you're reviewing it and giving me your feedback. So the example I put in there is, Imagine if you could be the only person in the world with a software on your phone that identified good prospects. It helped you know, it had a chat GPT built in to make the perfect invitation to get them to watch a video. 
the video would be customized to that particular pro pro prospect because it read all of their social media posts and everything online and knew everything about them and it knew all their emotional triggers and it created the perfect recruiting video that make everybody sign up. And then it showed them how to do that. And it was, and it, you know, every candidate that you put a presentation in front of, it measured their eye movement. It measured their heartbeat, their breathing rate. It changed the script as they are watching it based on their physiological thing. So it could guarantee you would sponsor 100 people out of 100 people. Imagine if that software was available today and you were the only person in the world who could get it. What would happen next? Uh, you would become the most successful network marketer in the world. You would make more money than any other network marketing in the history, men network marketer in the history of the world. And a year from now, you would be out of the business. You would be so frustrated at your lack, your inability to get any duplication for anyone to reproduce even a hundredth of a percent of your results, and you would realize this amazing software, there's so many better uses for it than it is in network marketing. Because it doesn't matter what works, it matters what duplicates. <laughs> so, you know, what's the biggest issue I'm seeing today? It's all these people getting distracted by these coaches teaching all of the distraction stuff instead of you have to have a block of time in your calendar every week where you're contacting candidates. You have to do rain maker activity. Mm -hmm. The Watching training videos is not Rainmaker. Reading books is not Rainmaker. Sending emojis to your group. I'm fired up. Who else is fired up? And getting text chains and WhatsApp groups with 10,000 emojis. Those are not Rainmaker activities. Rainmaker activities are getting candidates in front of presentations, converting those candidates into customers and distributors, and following up with people who have been in front of those presentations and haven't decided yet. And until you block that in your calendar, you're never, all this AI stuff is just going to take you further away from where you want to be. So that's kind of, I told you, the, you, you know, that top would take me off on a, a lot of different directions. That's, that's where I would go with that. I just want to add there, uh, and going back to what you said before, you know, the 95% is about worthiness and limiting belief and um, uh, being out of touch with uh, our essence, you know, as, as human beings. So what I see is that um, all of these distractions is, is distracting <laughs> to the people that they are not ready to really... Um, uh, take care of the business, you know, to really embrace the business and have the uh, the the self worthiness and the and the and the discipline and the work ethic, uh, the work ethic to really uh, grasp, you know, the, uh, the 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 values of the business and really build the business the way that it should be built. And so, it's, it's to me, it's like a confirmation that the uh, most of people, um, they're consciousness is not there yet to to really um tackle the business and uh and uh, make the most out of it and so it just confirms that our role is to work with the leaders and work with the mindset and you know keep uh helping them to to grow and uh to to heal and to uh, change those beliefs you know so they don't, they don't get distracted, they don't get pulled over, they don't get, you know, um, uh, uh, blocked by the uh, dark forces, you know. Who's your ideal candidate these days? 
who are you looking for that you want on your team? What are their, what's their demographic or their characteristics? Anything jump to mind? Um, I, I, I never had that. Um, I, I struggle with that idea of, you know, in, 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 um, in the, um, social media marketing and all of that, they talk about the famous avatar, you know, who, who is your avatar? And, and so if you ask me as a coach, I have a more of a clear, you know, picture of that because I do have what my, I do know what my uh, strengths are and uh, the, the people that I can help best to, to, to grow into their, you know, uh, achievement and, 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 uh, 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 you know, process of professional process and a spiritual process. Um, I'm, I have an idea, but in, in network marketing, um, I'm very open, man. I'm I'm just open to receive. To I'm open and receptive, like we said in Unity. You know, I'm open and receptive to um, to to work with people that they are, you know, willing to work. They are, and especially when I say willing to work, I want to say this is not only willing to work of doing the uh, physical work of building the business. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking willing to work in their mindset, in their personal, you know, development, in their leadership skills. And they are, uh, you know, they are hungry of results. They, they are ambitious. They want to do better. Uh, they are willing to work. I would say that, that to me is, is the, uh, the, the willingness the the hunger is what I'm looking in people. I'm not, you know, I'm not into. Um, I I I I like to work with professional people or with blue collar people, or women or, you know, women or or young people or I. You know what I what I think and I sometimes I teach my 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 leaders and I I approach it this way is that. Um, out of a hundred people in, the, and this is a, a, an opinion. It's not. It's not the truth, you know. But it, it, it could be a good conversation. Out of a hundred people in a network marketing company, I would say probably you know sixty to seventy percent they are just consumers. Um, even though they maybe they bought a, a a business kit or whatever, and maybe they had an intention of doing the business, but I would say in the real world, seventy percent of them are just you know, consumers. They just like the product, they like the company, they like the people, and they are hanging in there doing their, you know, pre-purchases and 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 doing the 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 product thing. And then you have maybe a 20% of people that they are uh I would say sellers. Somehow they they focus in one of the different activities in the business. They either do you know direct selling or they do party plans or they do internet marketing or they do um they go to um business owners to to sell them the product or whatever you know that they have and then you have of course the maybe the five percent of the people that i call the leaders that they have all of these people within the team and they have the flex the flexibility and the mindset and the leadership leadership skill to work with all of them you know so in that sense i see myself and i my top people, you know, my top leaders, I see them as people that they they can do it all. I mean, I can do a party planning with you in, in, and teach you how to do it, or I can do uh, a leadership training, or I can do um, direct selling, if that is the case. It's not what I'm going to do every day, but if you need to be trained on that, I'm going to have a system for that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be happy doing that because that's what you want to do. And so when you ask me the question, who is your uh, uh, perfect candidate is the person who is willing to do all of that. They have the leadership vision. They want to do something big with the business. Um, they are willing to learn. And those are the people that, I, that I'm willing to work with uh, in the long run. You know, even though I'm helping everyone, everyone in the team, uh, especially through system and tools, um, but I, I have people in that category. I have people that they are, Super, they are doctors and they have three PhDs and they are very smart, you know, educated people. And I have housewives, like you were saying before. 
So it's more about what they want and what they are willing to do for what they want than any other um, profile. Um, that, that's what I that's what I see in the business. And to me personally, uh, the other thing that I always look in people is people that they they are purpose driven. They have a good heart. They they want to do the business. They want to make money. They want to be successful. But they have, I would say, uh, um, the right purpose to do the business. You know, they they are not um, um, looking for make money or to please their ego or to you know to do something that may may not be right for the for the for the whole team. You know, for the whole people. You know, they are people that they have. Uh, um, and, you know they have some kind of purpose in life. They 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 like to serve. They like to uh, help other people. They have this um, sensitivity about um, it's about serving others rather than that you know serving yourself. Uh, when I see people that they are too hungry, that the only thing that they're thinking about is just to recognition of the trip, or whatever, or the money. Um, you know, I try to help them out to to broaden, you know, to to make wider their vision and 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 help them to find within themselves that bigger purpose, you know, uh, because I think that that that's the key, you know. What did you take on that? Yeah, I mean the uh, especially the last part. The, there's people don't. Uh, they can get so enamored with the money if they join, if they get presented the business that way, mm -hmm. the rah, rah hype stuff, they just, they go out in the world and they have commission breath. <laughs> just <laughs> anybody they get in front of, it's like they're just breathing this commission breath on them. And it's so repelling to candidates Mm -hmm. that don't want anything to do with that. Whereas I just, I, I, people have not, they're not reading the room. You know, I don't know if that translates in Spanish. In English, we say, you got to read the room. Yes. You got to read the room. your environment. The, 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 the bimbos and bikinis and the lambos is not what the room is talking about right now. What the room is talking about now is, my God, how do I pay for my diabetes medicine? How do I wish I could afford to go to the dentist? How do I, you know, do my choosing between the insulin or the groceries is, oh my God, this credit card company is really charging me 29.99% interest. I'm paying $700 a month interest on this one credit card and I make three thousand dollars a month and now 700 of it is eaten away with you know what i mean if we, they would just get out there with hey let's get you debt free let's pay off your credit cards let's create a quality of life mm -hmm. let's create a legacy for your kids your loved ones it's they're just the results will immeasurably increase almost immediately Totally agree. And, you know, I one of the things that we are working with our team, my wife especially, he, she's very into it, is building communities, you know. Um, I, I think that all these nonsense that we are seeing, all this negative programming that we are seeing in the um, social media and the uh, government and, and all of that, I see that is the perfect stone for a right leader in the right company to create a right vision, you know, because people, even though they are, and we we're talking about, you know, when we have breakfast the other day, we we're talking about that people, you know, if they keep going that route, Randy, they're not going to have a chance. I mean, like you said, the self-esteem, their self-worth is going to be so low that they don't stand a chance, you know, in, in, in the next 10, 15 years. And so, there is a lot of people that they are zombies within the matrix, but if you show them the right 
purpose, the right cause, you know, the right vision, they will, they will, they want to belong, you know, they want to be part of it. They want to help a, um, you know, a, 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 a stray dogs foundation, you know, and the, uh, and the uh, uh, the organic farming in uh, Africa and whatever you know, people are you know the 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 maybe because we have so much of a technological development now we have time you know to start thinking about these uh, more specific you know um, desire of inner desire of of human beings, mm -hmm. and so if you help people to to connect you know to make. To, to do a conscious connection with their purpose in life, with their meaning, you know, and, um, and and show them a way to escape out of that, you know, meaningless, superficial, you know, TikTok life. I I think they they really want to do it. You know, I, I I think they they I would say most of them, you know, they really want to escape that. You know, remember that you make this tape. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, about the rat race, you know, escaping the rat race and all of that, that became, uh, you know, a huge um, story, you know, a huge uh, paradigm for the industry. Now I think that people want to escape the uh, the new rat race will be the, uh, the the nonsense life, the, the, the meaningless life, you know, because yeah. Yeah. you see a lot of people, I live in a condominium here in, in Doral, and I see a lot of people here, Randy, that I, I talk to them, you know, I'm, I'm always prospecting, by the way, you know. Uh, so I, I, you know, I meet them in the in the gym, in the pool. Uh, we talk, you know, we have kids. I have a five years old. And sometimes, you know, these young families, young couples, they have kids or they have dogs or whatever. And so I see a lot of people and it's not a, it's not very, uh, um, I mean, this is an expensive place, you know. And so a lot of people, very young people, and I start talking with, talking with them, and they they are not in the rat race. I mean, they have some kind of a geek, you know. They do I don't know whatever Amazon marketing. They do uh, they export goods to their um, home country. They they do home businesses. I would say I don't know, but probably half of the people that live in this business and this building and is this is a, this is a I don't know, 300 apartment building, uh, very comfortable with, you know, working areas. And I go to my co-working area in the, in the building, 10 a.m. in the morning, everything is working. I mean, everything is full. People are working there. Uh -huh. you know? And so what I'm trying to say is I see I see a lot of people that they are not in the rat race. You know, like we, we talk about the rat race, like, 30 years ago, people were going to work from nine to five and they don't have time to do anything else and and all of that. And I know that there is a lot of people that are still trapped in that, but I'm I'm talking about United States market, you know, 2024. There is a lot of people that they're making money. They have found a way to somehow make money, uh, internet marketing, and you know, technology, whatever. But they don't have a purpose in that. They, 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 they don't know what to do Saturday, five o'clock in the afternoon, but, you know, just lay down in the sofa with their dog, the $2,000 dog with the uh, $3,000 coach, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, sofa and watch Netflix for, you know, four hours and do a whole series of whatever. And they wake up on Monday morning. They don't have economic economic needs i would say <laughs> they are not worried about you know not having food for their kids tomorrow morning so it's not that kind of hunger it's more like a a, a deeper sense of purpose what i see that the network marketing especially in developed countries maybe in the non-developed countries is a different scenario that we that 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 is not what I'm talking about here, but I'm I'm saying about my reality, your reality today here in the United States and any, and any other developed countries. Uh, the uh, let's you know, let's make the million dollars and have the private chat and you know have the Lamborghini um, offer is not longer 
so attractive. And I think that's 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 a pivot, you know, pivot point for our profession as well. So that's why I I, I, was, talk, I was talking about these creating communities and helping people to have a vision for their lives and and then network marketing is like that bridge, you know, that they can help to go from a point A to point B, but not because they need money, but because maybe they they uh, need or they are looking for a um, someone to guide them or to help them to become more as a person, you know, or even um, just a sense of belonging, sense of belonging, the yes. community that you're talking about. Absolutely, that that's what I see also in the uh, in that ideal candidate question that you were talking about. People that they are moved to do that, they they want to be part of that. You know, um, right now we started the business, that the company that I'm working with, we started, you know, 10 years ago back in Colombia, did really well. Now we moved to the United States with my wife, moved back about a year and a half ago. And we started building here. We have a huge team in South America. Now we build in, in, in the States. And the, the interesting thing that I wanted to mention is that when we got here to Miami, we found a lot of people that they have a code within my team, but they, they were not connected with the business, you know, and they really liked the product, but they were using the product or not, but kind of, a, you know, unplugged. And we started, you know, talking to people and reconnecting some of those people. And right now my wife has a terrific, you know, um, uh, ladies, a women team, you know, John professional, you know, in, in her spectrum of, you know, in, in, in uh, people that are relatable to, to her. And they, you know, those ladies six months ago, one year ago, they they didn't know anything about, you know, they, they knew about the program, the business, the company, but they, they were doing nothing. But now they have a community. They have a ladies thing and they're doing things in the internet and they're doing power, you know, women empowerment uh, meetings and they are thinking about reaching out to women and to uh, many of them are uh, single mothers. They are, you know, from Latin uh, immigrants here living in Miami and they have these um, things that they have in common. And so that's just an example, you know, and that's what I'm talking about, you know. So when you have people that they want to do the business and they have this uh, um, desire of doing, not only making money, but they want to make money because they have a purpose behind that, I think that is what, that I would, that I would, what I would look for a leader yeah. nowadays, you yeah. know. All right, I have one last thing that we always do at the end. Do you? Oh have my God, we have two hours, man. Yeah. Do you have anything else on your list you want to go over? First? I have this. I have this stupid little question, uh, and actually, it was it actually was a, my, my wife question. You know, she uh, as you know, she really admired your all your work that you have done, both in the world marketing and prosperity uh, consciousness. And uh, she's very, uh, always very moved with your personal story, you know, and and she had this question. I just want to uh, leave it up there for you. Um, imagine today's Randy Cage going back to that jail where the uh, teenager Randy Cage was, you know, uh, I'm sorry, you just got uh, emotional for a second here. Um I always remember, and she remembers to your story about, you know, being kind of rescued for a, a guy that went to visit you, a teacher, I think it, it was, or something that went to visit you and give you some encouraging, encouraging words. And uh, we work a lot with, with teenagers, you know, and, and we work with um, families that they have teenagers with, you know, with different challenges. I would say that's why this question is relevant for them, I'm thinking about them, you know, in, in our team. And I, I'm sure that many leaders listen to this call may relate to that. So we have a whole generation of teenagers that, like you said, they are doomed to, we don't know what's gonna happen in the next few years with all this nonsense in 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 the uh, in the social media. So being all that, you know, uh, 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 problematic, you know, rebellious 
uh, uh, teenager that you were with uh, drug problems and, and all of that, what would you say to a young teenager that going to the challenge, being today the mature man that you are with all the uh, experience that you're going through, what would be your conversation with that? If you have to give some kind of encouragement to that Randy Gage, young Randy Gage, what would you tell him? It makes sense. The question, it makes sense. Yeah, 100%. I get a little I, bit emotional, so I, I, I don't know if I explain myself. It makes total sense because I face that question regularly because one of the things I do to give back is I speak to at-risk teens, schools, sometimes centers or, adopt, you know, uh, foster care places. And the hardest ones, jails. Mm -hmm. So I'll go to a jail and they'll have the kids lined up there. And, you know, it'll be, you, you know, how we like to be introduced as speakers and how you edify the speaker and how we teach people to do that in network marketing. Where do you speak in jail? Here's how I get introduced 90% of the time when I'm speaking in those situations. I say, we let you out of your cell. We have a guest speaker today. His name is Randy Gage. He's rich. He's successful. He used to be where you are. If you even look at him cross-eyed, you're going back to your cell. You better give him your complete attention. Please welcome Mr. Gage. <laughs> <laughs> These kids, the arms are crossed. The legs are crossed. The body language is just... Who the fuck is this clown? This old, bald, white guy they're bringing in to tell me about my life. What does he know about me? And so I share my story of being in jail for armed robbery and burglary at 15 years old. And all of a sudden, the arms start to uncross and the legs start to uncross and the eyes start to perk up and the people start leaning forward because I have showed them that I'm qualified to talk to them, to teach them because I've been where they are. And some of them are even more severe, right? Some of these kids are in there for murder. So even I can't reach that bridge at that point. Uh, but I get to them with just... Talking about, you know, the, the timeless themes of victimhood or victory. You can be a victim. You can be a victor. You can't do both. you got to choose. Choose mindfully. You, you know, those kids, they have every excuse in the world for being there. They one family homes. No, you know, one parent homes. No parent homes. Parents are drug dealers. Parents are axe murderers. They were incested. They were molested. They're living in drug ravaged neighborhoods. They have every excuse in the world to say, it's not my fault. I'm a victim of circumstance. And all I can tell them is sharing my story that I thought that I thought the way they're thinking right now that I was a victim of circumstance for 30 years. Because even though, you know, I, I had a wonderful, I had a, you know, this Baxter Richardson was the name of the teacher who came in and spoke to me in the cell, the guy you mentioned. He mm -hmm. said, you don't belong here. You're capable of great things. And I'm like, you have no idea. You don't even know who you're talking to. Come into here with this motivational bullshit He's like, no, I talked to your teachers. You skip school for three weeks straight and you come in and you ace a test. Do you realize your reading comprehension level is higher than college level? You, you really don't belong here. You really are capable of great things. And, you know, I've been sitting in that cell for a couple of months. You got a gray door. It has one of those little glass windows in it with the wire that runs through the glass. There's mm -hmm. a clock outside the window in the hallway. So you sit on your 
metal cot, staring out the window, tick, 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 watching the clock. You know, so I've been doing that for months. I was so desperate to believe him that I believed him. And because I believed him, it was true. If I wouldn't have believed him, it wouldn't have been true. And that's, that's the message I have to take to those teenagers. That, no, you really don't belong. Yeah, I get it. You have all the excuse, You know, I hated being poor. I hated not getting, you know, the kids I went to school with, they had go-karts and mini bikes and snowmobiles. And I went to school with kids. They turned 16 years old and their parents bought them a new car. I mean, this was such, I went to school with kids. They had their own bedroom. Oh my God. I thought they must be multimillionaires because they had their own bedroom, right? I hated being poor. I hate, and you know, teenage alcoholic, teenage drug addict. I made so many poor choices. Um, so I created my reality. And I had all the great excuses that could, you know, tell me why it wasn't my fault. But when he said, you're capable of great things, I wanted to believe that. Because sitting in that jail cell, looking through that little square window, tick, 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 I realized, you know, the choices I'm making aren't serving me. I couldn't have articulated them in that in those words, but that was the realization that I had come to. That, okay, I so the thing was, even after, so he believed in me, the social worker believed in me, the public defender believed in me, even the judge believed in me. The judge said, okay, I'm going to give you probation. If you go out, you keep yourself, keep yourself clean, you will, you know, when you turn 18, this will be expunged from your record. You will have a clean record. You'll be able to build your life. So I'd love to say that instantly I was transformed, but I wasn't. I still was a victim until I was 30 years old. Finally, after all the health challenges and all the negative dysfunctional relationships and all of the money problems. That's, of course, when I asked that question, you know, is there one person who was always at the scene of the crime? <laughs> and you know, you've heard me ask that question a hundred times probably. Um, that was the, the question that transformed my life. That's the question that I got to share with those at-risk kids, teens. Um, is that no you, you yeah if you if you're looking for validation why you don't have a chance the society's going to give you a million great excuses for it but you're still going to be a victim and you have all these great excuses for being a victim but you're still going to be a victim and at at some you know same and I'd say the same thing to anybody who's struggling right now in their network marketing business yeah, you say, my products are too expensive. They don't make enough in the comp plan. My sponsor is too stupid. The company makes, you know, okay, great. Got a lot of great excuses. So if you want to stay a victim, just keep reciting those excuses. Or you will decide, I choose to no longer be a victim. I choose to be a victor. And then your whole world changes. And um, that's the message I would give those kids. So thanks for asking. Thank your wife for asking that wonderful, wonderful question. Um, and so the last thing is our new tradition, which is whoever my partner is each week, I ask them, what was the worst rejection or the worst presentation you ever had in your career? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that one. Uh, I have se I have seen a, a bunch of the uh, the chapters. Um, I I think I have a few, you know, but I'm thinking in one. 
uh, one of the worst, I, I would say the worst, but one of the worst was the, uh, the, uh, I have two, I'm going to say two. Uh, in with this company that I'm working now, when I, when I started 10 years ago, I'm this successful coach, you know, and, uh, and I start doing the business and, um, I have like a group of people that they do master coaching to them. You know, I, I teach them about coaching and I have two of these guys that they come over and say, Hey, um, <clears throat> we, we heard that you started this, uh, network market, this pyramid business, uh, <clears throat> Do you have any money problems, coach, master? They they call me master. Master, do you have any problem? Do you have any money problem? We can lend you money. We can. <laughs> and I was like so humiliated, you know, by <laughs> young oh, kids. God, you know, like, oh, it's and I was like, no, I actually don't have any problem, but I I I can't show you. At that time, I I had like maybe a month and a half in the business. I have pretty good, solid, you know, first few checks. And um, and I showed them, you know, that I was making very good money. Uh, so I kind of escaped the situation with that. But it was so confronting for my ego and my professional, you know, status, being uh -huh. as a coach and all of that shit, you know. Uh, <laughs> I was humiliating. But there was one incident that I, I think that we talked about this before. Um, I went down to a trailer park. I, this was Agile time. It was Agile 2006 probably 2007 probably i don't know um <clears throat> I, I i was already a leader you know top 10 in the company and all that shit and uh i had this presentation down in southwest southwest 8th street you know going down to crown avenue crown avenue um there was like a trailer park it doesn't it's not, it's not there anymore. Yeah, Chrome Avenue, that's the trailer park neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. And so I go there to do a presentation for a lady. It was not actually from my team. It was actually from um, Anderson. What is the name? Uh, Wes. Wes Anderson. Wes Anderson team and Billy team at that time. Um, so I, I go there to do this presentation. And uh, I, I, I'm sure that Wes can can remember that because I was, I was, I wanted to kill him. It was Hispanic. <laughs> it was a Hispanic family. So Wes asked me to go there to help him out, and uh, the lady didn't show up. You know, the, uh, the, 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 the team member didn't show up. So I ended up doing this pres this presentation to three people that they were drunk. You know. Oh and my. And I said, you know, I have to do this presentation because, you know, and I was this, like I said, I was the leader. I was driving a very nice car and all of that. And I, I, I remember that has a, has a, uh, a decisive point in my career, you know, in network market. I think, and I was probably two years into the business, like building the business. But I think that day I decided to become a professional, you know, to do the business uh, regardless of the circumstances, you know, and it was like a, I don't know, kind of a vaccine that I put into myself that night mm -hmm. and uh, inoculated that thing into me. And I can, you know, since then I have faced many different situations. I, in Colombia, I went to a uh, build with a long distance team. I never forget that one. Uh, I traveled for like eight hours in a very uh, dangerous area to get to help this team and no one showed up and I really didn't care. I started up, you know, talking to people and I prospected a couple of people in the place that I was staying and I made the best out of it. But many different other situations, but I remember that trailer park in, in, in Miami. <laughs> it really was one of those, you know, <laughs> tattoo things that I say, you know what, I'm going to do this no matter what, and I and I'm doing this for me, for my for my team, um, regardless of the circumstances, you know, doing whatever it takes to 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 achieve the goal. So I think I remember that was the worst one. And maybe we we'll talk about it before. I, I think that I don't we, remember that. No. Remember that? I, no. I'm sure Wes will remember that because I I was talking to Wes and I wanted to kill him, you know. Um you put I'm me sure. in this one. <laughs> 
<laughs> he has one that is pretty similar. You know, Wes has one of those um, stories where I think it was a dog that wanted to bite him during a presentation or something like that. You know, was something uh, was something similar. But this one, this one was a Hispanic family. Um, they were drunk. Um, they didn't pay attention to the presentation, you know, uh, and, and the worst thing was that the, uh, the team member didn't show up. So no, there was nobody there to edify the diamond, you know, whatever. Uh, so, uh, great story, great, great lesson. Yeah. That's why I made this a tradition. People think, oh, successful people, they never have any projection. They never oh, experience me. what I went through. And when they hear these stories, it's so good at building their belief. So that's why they share this. All right. For all you guys watching and listening, we're back with a vengeance in 2024. We're putting out a new, I went back to weekly. People are begging for it. So we're going to, we post a new show every Tuesday. YouTube Duplication Nation MLM podcast, and then it's on all the podcast platforms. Make sure you subscribe, tell your team about it, tell your friends. Go to duplicationnation.com, sign up for the free email newsletter. Mr. Jose, my friend, it has been so delightful. I'm so grateful you joined me for this. Um, thank you for being a part and sharing your insights and your wisdom and your heart. Love you, man. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, let's keep doing this. Let's, I, I think network marketing is, is the hope of the future for this society. I, I, and I would say that like that. So let's keep building good stories in within the profession and let's giving people hope through a system that can really help them to grow as person and to achieve the goals. And that's what we have with our marketing. So this is my passion. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure. You know, we love you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Peace. Hey, guys, I'm back. And I just want to thank you for listening or watching and let you know if you made it this far, you are a serious credible leader. You're somebody committed to success, professionalism, and honing your craft, sharpening your saw. So I want to recommend a resource to you. It's a monthly newsletter called MLM Confidential. Leadership lesson every month, duplication lesson every month, something we call the dish, which is kind of the industry news, what's going on in the space who's moving where, what company is shutting down, what company is opening up, what is the, you know, the, the dish, the dirt of what's really going on behind the scenes that maybe the average person doesn't know. And there's a personal challenge every month. So check it out, mlmconfidential.com. I'll see you next week.